Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Richard Skipper celebrates the best in entertainment. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique. Never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy Monday, everyone. And welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. What are you celebrating today? Well, for me, I'm celebrating the fact that it's National Cocoa Day. I'm actually drinking from my Richard Skipper Celebrates mug. And I'm also celebrating the fact that this past week, I had the opportunity of doing not one, but two live appearances on stage. Uh, I'll tell you about uh, two of, I mean, about those two. Uh, first of all, this past Friday night, thanks to my dear friend, Sue Mitsuki, I was on stage at Urban Stages once again. Uh, and this time I was celebrating the one and only Karen Akers. We sat down in conversation and we were able to talk about her life, her career, and her body of worth. And also last Monday night, I was hosting once again, uh, the Legacy Awards uh, for Dancers Over 40. This was the 13th annual one. And I will tell you, 13 is a lucky number for me because I also hosted the first one uh, 13 years ago at Swing 46. This time around, we were at Lips. But one of the recipients that night was Tony Vogue. And uh, we were sitting at the same table, and I want to tell you, uh, with all due respect to his husband and my husband too, I fell in love with him. And I asked him if he would come and be my guest today, and he said yes. I'm going to bring him on for in a few moments, but before I do, he's working on a fabulous documentary all about tap dance and dance and everything else. And we're going to delve into his past, his present, his future, and all about the world of dance. But here's a clip from that documentary, and then we'll meet him on the other side. Here he is, Tony Vogg. <laughs> Well, Tony, they couldn't keep you and me down on the farm. <laughs> Welcome to the show. First of all, I want to begin by asking you, what are you celebrating today? Oh, my gosh. What am I celebrating today? Um, we, uh, My husband and I are closing on a uh, townhouse out in uh, New Hope, Pennsylvania on Friday. So we just got the good word that it's all set and done and... Yeah, I'm I'm not moving, but I'm expanding. Good for you. And you just got back from Hawaii. I know that you uh, had a wonderful trip uh, uh, climbing up and down the volcanoes in <laughs> Hawaii. And uh, as you told me last uh, Monday night, and uh, it was great 
meeting you uh, for the first time, and uh, we're going to get to know each other a little bit better today. Um, and I know that your journey uh, began in Colorado, uh, and uh, I asked you today uh, for a photograph, and I have to tell you, there is so much to dissect in this photograph. Uh, I asked for a photograph of you at five years old, uh, because to me, there's a reason for this, Tony, because to me, the five-year-old self is the purest self. Uh, that's before school starts, before peer pressure starts to get layered on you, before teachers start telling you who you should be or who you shouldn't be. And you sent me this incredible picture. And I want you to take us back and I want you to tell me about this five-year-old Tony. I mean, you look like you're a gangster about to take over Colorado with this picture. <laughs> uh, what can I say? Let's see. That house is the first house I grew up in. And my dad actually built that house. He was a bricklayer. And um, he, he actually laid all those bricks. I... I've come to find out, you know, years later, I've, I, I do wear a lot of hats um, in my business, but I've always worn hats when I was a kid. So I, I go back and look at all these photographs and now I'm, I'm always, I always have some sort of hat on. So um, I don't know whether that was to accentuate who I am or to hide from who I am and be somebody else. I'm not sure. Never hide, <laughs> never hide. Um, brothers, sisters? Oh yeah, um, two sisters. By uh, my parents got uh, remarried when I was about that age, probably right around that time mm -hmm. of that photograph, and they both remarried two amazing other people. So I've always had four parents. So I have two sisters, and then I have two stepsisters and four stepbrothers. A couple of them have are now deceased but oh, basically sorry to hear that a very yeah. well it's you know we're getting old so a lot of these yeah well thanks my for parents, that thanks for that reminder <laughs> but my parents are gone and yeah. um well i have one my stepfather's still alive which is um, and uh well tell me a little bit about the household that you were growing up i mean it's uh you know uh a um a chop suey household, if you will, because, you know, you're uh, mixed families coming together. Uh, yeah. But you, um, did you grow up in a household uh, of entertainment? Uh, was there music playing? Um, what, tell me a little bit about the household that you grew up in. And what was your earliest exposure to uh, the business of show? The business of show. I like that. Um, well, you know, come to find out when I really started, um, thinking about it I, because I always thought, well, I came out of the blue, but my dad was very, very funny. My dad had a perfect pitch and sang all the time. And my same with my mother, she knew all the standard songs and was really into the big band era. And so we'd listen to music all the time. She played the drums, she played the violin, um, you know, just as an amateur, but I didn't realize that I probably grew up listening to all this music because I, I do feel kind of like um, uh, reincarnated sometimes because I'm drawn to everything from 1928, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. oh, that, that music. So I listened to that music. And I also watched a lot of Hollywood films with my mother late at night. Mm -hmm. so I, had, I had this drive to be... Um, uh, and an entertainer, even though in college I was an art major. So, well, now, I, I you know, a lot of people watch these films, but when did the bug hit you that you started getting outside of watching it and it started actually moving through your feet and you started to uh, become a dancer? Well, if we're talking about tap dance, which is what mm -hmm. I ended up specializing in, I dabbled in everything before that. But I had the good fortune of uh, meeting my mentors in my hometown, Fort Collins, Colorado. I, um, Brenda Buffalino and Charles Cookie Cook and Bubba Gaines came to the university there um, 
Fort Collins, in Fort Collins. And I said, well, I like, you know, I love tap dance. And I had dabbled a little bit. So I went to a workshop. I met Brenda. I met Cookie. I met Bubba. And then the same um, uh, summer, this was right out of high school, 1976, mm -hmm. I uh, had a chance to go see Bubbling Brown Sugar, a production of Bubbling Brown Sugar in Denver with Charles Honey Coles. Wow. And I, ca I called him along with a friend and said, we're tap dancers, we're coming to visit you. And he invited us to dinner after the show. So here I am sitting with Charles Honey Coles the same, same time as I met uh, Brenda and Cookie and Bubba. Cookie and Bubba are members of the Copacetics. I, I'm sure you know who they are. Or well, of course, yes. And uh, Honey was kind of the ringleader at one time. And um, so the rest is history, really. That's why I wanted to show that segment, because I am from a very small town. I mean, I, I grew up in Fort Collins, but actually five miles outside of Fort Collins in a little town called Tidmouth, 250 people, really. Um, and I want to ask you if I came to New York. I want to ask you what you remember from that night of being able to meet someone, obviously, who you idolized, one of the best tap dancers in the business, um, and what advice he imparted to you, uh, someone who is very young, who is just starting out. Um, tap dance at this point, um, I'm assuming, and I could be wrong, uh, was something that you were just starting to think about as a possible career choice for yourself. Yeah, I, I I would assume that that honey and I and I do feel the vibe of that evening, in that he was first of all very generous. I mean, a complete stranger, a kid, really, you know, um, to to sit down with somebody and and uh, share a meal is a is a big big deal. Um, may, you know, I've been on tour and sometimes, yeah, it's kind of a lonely s sort of situation. But he's, he had at that time already been through the mill. I mean, he had a very, very difficult time being a black man yes. at the time that he was at his top top of his game there there wasn't really any work for for him mm -hmm. so so when he got in bubbling brown sugar that was a big deal so i think he was generous and also very happy to share uh a resurgence of of an art form of uh, tap dance you know and so so when you when you hear younger people now say you know what are you doing in this business and you know why do you have any sort of investment it's because i was given an amazing gift by a very generous person, several people, including Brenda and Cookie and Bubba and Honey and Buster and and Greg Hines. Oh my God, mm -hmm. these were people that I idolized oh. and actually got to meet and work with. And so, I, I don't know if I answered your question. I'm rambling. Absolutely, no, it's okay. I used to see I used to see Gregory Hines in the neighborhood. I used to work on 57th Street, and I used to like practically run into him every single day. And he was so generous with his time. Oh yeah, I was such a, a fan of his, and uh, just to see him, and he would always stop and say hello because it was like we were in the in the same neighborhood, and he was always very generous with his time. But were there a lot of opportunities for you at this point when you started um, uh, dancing uh, in Fort Collins, or did you feel that you needed to step outside? of uh, that parameter of where you were. And if that was the case, where did you gravitate towards? And was it New York? Was it LA? Or was it within the state? Well, there, there were very limited <laughs> opportunities in Fort Collins, of course. And <laughs> I had just graduated from high school. I took one year there at Colorado State as a sculpture major. Um, and then I got the bug, the dance bug, and I decided to go to the University of Utah, which was one of the only uh, schools that was still accepting. And they had a uh, focus and a major on uh, musical theater. So I uh, got in and I went to Salt Lake and I spent a couple years there. Um, the third year, I changed my major to theater from dance to theater. 
because I never really, you know, I hate to say that, and I don't say this to younger people now, like I never planned on graduating. I never took a required <laughs> class. I changed my major every year to avoid having to take calculus and things. So um, then I moved to San Francisco and I guess uh, it was a, a step up in terms of opportunity um, but it was also at a time, late seventies, I was coming out, you know, it was, I went to San Francisco to find myself and I got my equity card there. And then I moved to New York and I said, I was going to look up the copacetics in that Buffalo woman. What was the show that uh, you got your equity card with? Oh, it's this weird production called boy meets boy, which was originally produced in, in New York. Was that Bill Solly? Yes, Bill Solly. Yes. Uh, he wrote it. <laughs> I did a Bill Solly show. He wrote I did a show called The Cat in the Castle. I and I played that. Ham Hamwich, the royal cat catcher. <laughs> I've heard I've heard of that. Yes. So uh Bill Solly. Um, so was at this point getting your equity card an a goal of yours? Sure. I mean, I you know, I had a parallel kind of I knew that tap dance wasn't exactly popular at that time. And I had kind of the Broadway bug too. Mm -hmm. So once I got my equity card, I, I immediately said, okay, because I had been in San Francisco for three years and there wasn't that much going on. Mm -hmm. So I, I moved to New York thinking, you know, okay, Broadway, here I come. And I went <laughs> to auditions. First of all, it was more like crickets. It was like 19... 81 or something there or no wait no 81 seven nine um oh god let's see when was it it was 81 yeah it was that late could it be i Seven, came to new york in, i came to new york in 1979 so if it's the same time frame uh new york was a very different new york for those well, it, was, it was a chorus line pippin um Maybe that was a little earlier. Now I can't remember. But anyway, I did very badly at auditioning. I, I mean, I was terrible. I was never really a, a chorus person, but I was at, at that age and I kind of looked like a chorus boy. And um, and so I always kind of stuck out a little bit and, and opened my big mouth. You know, I, I'd be mm -hmm. like, excuse me, excuse me, what's this show about? You know, and the, and the, <laughs> the choreographer so director would be like, uh, next, goodbye. You know. So, did was it a show that brought you to New York, or was it ambition that brought you it, to New it York? Was ambition. Okay, it, it, was tap so, dance. it really was tap dance. I wanted to find Brenda, the cup of settings. I wanted to work with Gregory Hines. You know, I, I I came here to make a career at tap dance, which was crazy, but I did it. But you did it. So when you got to New York, did you, beyond the people that you've just named, did you have other connections in New York? Or did you, did you have to find your way in New York? Actually, I did have a lot of connections from the University of Utah. Most of those kids came to, to Broadway and ended up in, you know, the second, third string of Chorus Line and, and uh, you know, yeah, we all kind of migrated here because we were serious. There was an equity stage on on campus at the University of Utah. Uh, and I'm still friendly with a, a bunch of those people. So there were there I had a lot of, and I visited New York two or three times. So I now, where did you stay when you first got here? And did you have to have any survival jobs or did you go uh, did you start getting work as a dancer right away? Oh, I had survival. So I want to hear about the survival. Oh, yes, I did everything from uh, I worked at Macy's over Christmas once. I handed out flyers on the street for a copy shop. I mean, because I had I had um, some surgery on my knee, and so I couldn't really do anything but drag my leg around. And then, of course, I did all the uh, the waitering and the catering and the and the bartending for a couple of years. Um, while we organized and created the American Tap Dance Found uh, Orchestra, this the, the first company that I, my company now is called the American Tap Dance Foundation, mm -hmm. and it used to be called the American Tap Dance Orchestra, directed and choreographed by Brenda. We we put this company together, and um, so once I started 
rehearsing and working on that project, I slowly transitioned from having to, you know, bartend, <laughs> even though I found board members and things through that bartending job. <laughs> um, but then became, you know, finally threw in my apron and started. Um, now, before we get there, what do you consider your first big break in New York? My first big break in New York? Ah, um, well, uh, you know, I guess that wasn't really a break. It was the fact that I was asked to join forces with a number of people and start this this touring company and then we and then we were very popular and we <laughs> toured around the world really and thanks to greg we were on the a pbs uh tap dance in america special which got got us all kinds of work and you know we did the concert circuit for about 15 years and 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 then things slowed down a little bit and then i went back to some commercial work and i changed the name and I started my uh, festival, Tap City. In uh, tell us a little bit about your festival and, you know, and what you've learned, uh, you know, about how, you know, people perceive tap everything. I mean, I mean, when the tap dance kid was on Broadway, for example, um, there was this, for me, it felt like in New York, a resurgence of the way that people looked at tap. Am I correct about that? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. But and it's happened more than once. It, it yes. kind of like waves of interest and popularity. Uh, do you think that? Uh, I, I mean, do you think that we will ever have? I mean, I mean, with Tommy Tune, I mean, he's always. I mean, each time his shows have kept bringing tap back to Broadway. Where are we now in terms of the way that people? Um, are looking at tap on Broadway right now? Well, I don't think they're only looking at it on, on Broadway now. I think they're looking at it as a concert form of dance. Um, it's it's amazing to me that, you know, just yesterday, there were three different tap dance concerts. Now, when I, when I was starting in, in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s in New York, you'd be ha happy to have like one gig, you know, uh, that everybody heard about or, or uh, responded to, um, you know, every couple of weeks. Now there's, there's a lot of tap dance going on. And I think that the general public finally recognizes it as an, an American art form for one, they, they understand the history better. There's some controversy there, but, um, and now it's more than just a concert dance. Yes, it's on Broadway. Yes, it's back in films. Yes, it's on television with the competition, you know, um, dance competition shows, uh, but majorly in concert all over the world. I mean, it's an international art form now. I have friends that, that have their own companies, their own studios, their own everything in countries all over the world, from Brazil to Japan to France to um, everywhere. It's quite phenomenal, actually. And I think we're back here now for good. I don't think people are going to like go, oh, isn't that kind of old fashioned? No, it's not. It's very now, contemporary. Now, I want to talk about uh, a special relationship that you have, and that's with Mercedes Ellington. Okay. Uh, because the other night uh, you uh, presented her award to her. Mm -hmm. And she presented your award to you. Um, how did the two of you meet? And how did this incredible relationship, obviously, uh, you know, and I mean, I'm assuming that you both chose each other to present uh, these awards to the other night. Um, how did this relationship begin with the two of you? And uh, what is this strong bond that you two have with each other? I honestly still do not know where I met Mercedes, <laughs> but I'm I'm sure it, it's at a number you just over and over kind of similar events because jazz and tap dance are cousins and you know I uh, it, it may have been Greg Hines actually that that pulled us together because they're great friends and or they mm -hmm. were great friends and and Greg and I were great friends and. And he understood, and she understands, and I understand that 
this is the no brainer to put together, you know, Duke Ellington music and tap dance. It's been happening from the very beginning. I mean, Duke Ellington actually was a major advocate for tap dance. He made sure that he hired tap dancers religiously, almost for every concert. I mean, I didn't even know that until I dug deep, but um, I'm on Mercedes board. She's on my board. And, and the commonality of the whole thing is that we're, we're just trying to keep a partnership going. We're mm -hmm. trying to do projects together because again, it's, it's a no brainer. I mean, if you have a big band behind you, boy, can you tap dance? I know. know. Incredible. <laughs> well, I mean, what are some, I mean, from the, I mean, the, the world is constantly evolving and, and of course this business is constantly evolving since you first, uh, and this is probably a big broad question to ask you, but what are some of the biggest changes that have evolved uh, since your arrival in New York just a few years ago um, to this point that um, you really have embraced in terms of the way that the business now is being run? Uh, and what are some of the things that have changed that you really miss about what, it, I mean, that are a lot harder to deal with uh, nowadays? Okay, well, if, we're, if we if we want to talk about changes, I I do feel that you know once noise funk and um, black and blue and Jelly Roll uh, Jelly's Last Jam, once those shows were very popular on Broadway, there was no more this like division between what people were calling show tap and then jazz rhythm tap it's like the jazz rhythm tap was now on broadway mm -hmm. and though i don't like to talk about differences or in fact well actually i'd, I'd like to embrace major differences i i think variety is the spice of life and i love to see you know someone improvise and do some real like rhythm tap but i also love the, the broadway standards so I guess what I'm trying to say is I'm really happy that now you cannot divide those those categories so much that it's like what is Broadway tap now, mm -hmm. and and we have stuff coming up. Michelle Dorrance choreographed that uh, "Come Fly Away" or whatever it's called mm -hmm. up at the Open Center. Um, Ayadeli Cassell is doing the tap dance choreography for the new Funny Girl. Um, you know, these are these are contemporaries, if not people that I've been working with or um, trying to support for many years. Mm -hmm. and so there's those changes as well. I'm not sure that I miss anything because there are still the Randy Skinners of the world that are doing, you know, like classic. Um, cheek to cheek, which is cheek. theater. Yeah. Um, and, and all that stuff is valid too. I, I, I love all that. And I, and I am kind of, nostalgic about it but i think there's room for all of it mm -hmm. do you think it's getting harder um to get uh work out now or is it getting easier i mean uh covid aside of course uh because i mean the last uh year and a half uh i think has made everything everyone's a little bit more cautious in terms of how we are proceeding with everything um, you know, a friend of mine was over last night. They had tickets to see Mrs. Doubtfire last night. Mm -hmm. And uh, the show was shut down yesterday oh. because of someone in the company having COVID. So, uh, which is a very sad thing when people are coming in from out of town. And her son was here from North Carolina. And they had tickets to see the show last night. It was a huge disappointment. Um, it was my gain because they came here for dinner last night. Uh, but uh, it was, uh, I'm sorry that they weren't able to see the show. Uh, so, but is it harder to get, um, you know, uh, shows out there anymore or has it gotten easier? No, I, I mean, I think it's no different than any Broadway show in terms of a tap dance concert, if that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. I um i you know they're 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 they continue to uh 
show up. I mean, Ayadeli's back at the Joyce. Um, there, there. Uh, like I said, there were a couple concerts just the other night. I'm trying to remember where they are, but the, I'll tell you, tap dancers, to my knowledge, didn't stop. I know I didn't. I mean, I, but I'm, I'm lucky because I have a, a studio, a tap dance center, mm -hmm. so I was able to uh, still conduct classes through Zoom and things like that. Mm -hmm. It was not easy. Everything was very, very um, bizarre and remains to be that way. I am planning on my in-person tap festival in July. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think it's realistic because it's only December. Can you believe it? I know. <laughs> Christmas is next week. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, 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 I don't know. The jury's out. Everything is so different. Um, you know, if you're touring, I know you're dealing with it. every theater that you go to is going to have a whole different uh, protocol. And um, that's, I'm sorry to hear about, I think Broadway's really struggling because one person that says they've been exposed uh, mm -hmm. shuts everything down. Or they have to hire a bunch of backup people whether they need them or not. And aren't Broadway shows already stressed to the, you know, I mean. I, I can't even imagine, uh, you know, what, I mean, it, it's just so difficult. And I, you know, and I will say something else because, you know, I saw the other day on Twitter, I mean, people are gloating, you know, these, you know, the trolls that are out there, shut them down, folks. If you see a troll, lock them, get them off the internet, because, I mean, people gloating about a show like Diana that's shutting down next week, how anyone can gloat about any show shutting down, especially just before the holidays. Really, what is that about? That's... When so many people are going to be out of work and hopes, dreams, and everything. I want to ask you, I, I mean, going through this business, um, and this is for the people that are watching out there. My show is all about celebrating. So we all deal with disappointments and uh, dashed hopes and dreams in this business. I'm sure you've had your share as well. What gets you through the tough times in this business? Um, sometimes I think that I have a built-in switch says you know what you're you're you know you're doing the right thing you're in the right place i've already proved that it's gonna work out and so i don't i don't lose sleep i really don't mm -hmm. and i've been through some you know some times where it was like oh my god i think we're gonna shut down uh even recently with covid we didn't shut down. We just had to um, reorganize a little bit and readjust. And I still feel that, in fact, I'm not sure if this is true. It must be. I think the government, even this government, <laughs> this crazy government, is funding the arts more than yes. they were. Yes. And that's a great thing, even though it, they had to be kind of beat over the head with something. But, you know, Broadway, <laughs> dance concerts, music, whatever, you know, the arts need to be funded. And it's so obvious to you and I, right? Why? Mm -hmm. I mean, yes. on. not just the healing, but the the community aspect that it brings you, even if you just not even end up as a professional, you're working as a community, you're with other people, you know how to interact. The arts are so important that way. So I'm hopeful that that it's going to continue to be that way. And I really, really think that um, I just encourage everybody to go see a show. Yes. Well, let's talk about that for a moment. Did you have growing up uh, in grammar school, uh, as uh, elementary school, uh, high school, junior high school, did you have a good arts in education program in, in growing up? 
I think I did by by accident, really. Like I don't think that it was standard where I grew up, but I was really lucky to have the right teachers and mentors and and I guess I would even say my friends at at that moment that thought it was important. You know, the the music, the dance, the theater, the that the arts were important on some level. And my parents, not even not even being in the arts, were so supportive. I mean, they I think they, you know, standard lived vicariously really through that at least that part of something that they wanted or knew that were was important um, to them. So what was the reaction from your parents when you told them? I mean, obviously you'd you'd been to San Francisco, but what was the reaction from your parents when you told them that you were gonna go to New York uh, to pursue uh, a career? And as I said earlier, you came to New York in 1981. Um, New York was a very different New York. The way that I describe it, uh, again, coming to New York in 1979. A war zone. Um, um, I thought New York was going to be New York of uh, breakfast at Tiffany's and Sunday in New York. Um, but the New York that I arrived in was taxi driver and midnight cowboy. <laughs> 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 oh yes, absolutely. So I remember getting off. I remember um, I had never been anywhere. I was 18 years old, getting off the plane and taking my first cab ride. My first apartment was at 86 and Second Avenue, and that first cab ride from LaGuardia Airport to that first apartment, and sitting in the cab, seeing my first glimpse of New York, going. Where am I? <laughs> this isn't the New York that I saw in the movies. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh, I know. But what was your parents' reaction when you said, I'm going to go to New York to pursue this? I think they were only worried about my safety. I think they were, they were still very supportive of me pursuing my dream, you know. But I, but I think they were fearful. I, I think, I mean, it was clear that they thought oh no <laughs> but don't you think i mean but isn't there something i mean when i look back on that time i mean you may have been you know even with uh and i did those odd jobs too uh i was that first christmas in new york um they patted me and i was santa claus at gimbal's and i'm convinced to this day that i'm the reason that gimbal's is no longer around um yeah <laughs> Uh, but, yes, uh, but nice, pretty good guess. You know, uh, <laughs> I am. Uh, but uh, you know, it, it, you know, singing telegrams, all the odd jobs, working for the Green Room Answering Service. Um, you, you know, waiting tables. Uh, I, I always go back to Judy Garland in A Star Is Born, exactly. saying, "No matter what, I will never ever do that again." Uh, but there was something romantic about that time with my friends and everyone, we were all struggling together, getting together and going out for a cheeseburger at McHale's. Um, <laughs> there was nothing like it. And I miss it. I truly do miss it. Well, I guess I can say I miss that period too, but I, but I don't want to, I don't want to go back. <laughs> No, no. Really, I mean, I, I mean, I'm much better off now. Of course, I am too. I am too. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, I spent a lot of time in the village. You know, I, I had four or five different apartments in the West Village. It used to be different. I think we all mm -hmm. understand that things change, but it used to be much more of a neighborhood thing, like you said mm -hmm. with Greg. I mean, we. Greg used to live on uh, West 12th or whatever. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. um, and you would just run into people and you'd spend, there was time. I'm not sure that we have time to do anything now. And mm -hmm. time is so warped at the moment. I'm not even sure what time it is or what day it is. It's so strange. I was um, talking to someone recently and she was describing to her daughter what an answering service was at that point. <laughs> and she was explaining that you would call the answering service. And as I said, I worked for an answering service that you would call the answering service and you would pick up your messages. And the daughter said, 
that's such an invasion of privacy <laughs> that somebody would have your messages. And she said to her daughter, you reveal everything on Facebook every single day. <laughs> yeah, hello. But I mean, to go back, I mean, and but you're right. I mean, there was, you would go out, you'd see your friends, but people looked at each other uh, when you were at an audition instead of looking down at your phones all the time. Uh, those are the things that I truly miss that were part of New York at that time. So uh, you, you, you talked about your festival that's coming up. Uh, that's in July. Um, mm -hmm. How, I mean, what is a typical uh, day like in the life of Tony Vogue? Or is there such a thing as a typical day in your life? <laughs> um, uh, ooh, uh, I hope not. I hope not. I, I, I do tend to think that you know, I don't have like, thank God it's Friday or anything like that, because every day of the week I could be working or not. And what's great about what I've done or what I do or what I've set up to do is that I can come and go, really. Mm -hmm. I can I can perform if I want to. I don't have to. I do a lot. I, I wear a lot of hats going back to that. But every day and every week and every month and every year has has its ups and downs. And I've been around for a while. And, and my company, which I, you know, I'm very proud of, including the festival. The festival is going to be 22 years. Congratulations. Um, and the and the company's like 40 something years. Um, and it it's you know it's a nonprofit. And and so I design. The programs that I want to be involved in every, mm -hmm. every year. So, and I'm going through a big strategic plan now, and because it's time to print some new blood and some new energy and some new ideas. Um, but to be able to even say I'm doing that with a, a force behind me, I have a mm -hmm. board of directors and a staff and teachers and students and and. Um, fans you know I, that's I, wonderful. it's amazing it's, that's it's amazing. incredible and what keeps you motivated to keep doing what you do money no i'm just um, <laughs> no, you know what i still i am still fascinated with this art form and i'm, I'm fascinated with some new kinks in this art form because with black lives matter and, and with the COVID and everything, all of a sudden, things got a little touchy again. Like, is it a black art form? Is it a, are the whites taken over? You know, there were these issues that came up. And 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 actually, they, these are good issues to come up. It's like, oh, yeah, thank goodness. Forgot about racism. Hello. It still exists big time. Um, so well, let me, let's, let's talk about this for a moment. Okay. okay. I mean, here, you and I, um, are two white men yeah. uh, talking about racism. Okay. Let's just put that on the table first and foremost. Okay. Um, so, um, before these issues came up, was this something that you even thought about? I would say I, I've been thinking about them ever since I started a tap dance company because there's so much truth behind the fact that it is an African-American art form, but it's not only that. Mm -hmm. And things are much more complicated. And like Mercedes, I love Mercedes. What, one of the things that she constantly says is, you know, do your your research, everybody. It's much more complicated than that. It's not black and white. It's usually gray. Mm -hmm. And and what's wrong with gray? I mean, isn't that the goal? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that we're not so bifurcated and everything. So when this issue came up again, all of a sudden I felt kind of personally attacked in my community a little bit. Thank goodness, only a little bit, because I would have been devastated otherwise. Uh, that that I was supposed to do something about it. That I that I possibly took something or felt something or had more than was deserved and but that's not true you know so it's been an interesting journey 
And um, well, what have you learned about yourself on this journey, Tony? Well, I, I think I've learned that that, that I, I, it goes back to that that gift that that African Americans mentors of mine gave me. Mm -hmm. Now, is that something that I took? No, they gave it to me. So I I've learned that. Well, but okay, let's d maybe dig a little deeper. I didn't know that there were they were still redlining. I didn't know that there were all these other things that were going on that our government set in place. <laughs> Outrageous. So yes, I'm still growing up too. I'm revisiting racism on a new level. Uh, and and I and I think everyone needs to because it's not about in my case it's not about tap dance it's about just it's just about racism. But I think that you know the important thing that I think you know I look at I look at TCM for example, and I think that TCM uh, I'll use Gone with the Wind for example. Uh, I will admit, Gone with the Wind is one of my favorite movies uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, but I also am aware of the historical uh, inaccuracy right. of how some of the characters are treated in this film. I can look at Hattie McDaniel as a brilliant actress and see, I mean, in her scenes with, at the end, when Bonnie dies and her scenes with, uh, with uh, Clark Gable and Olivia de Havilland, there's no way that this woman should not have won an Oscar. But the way that she was treated and she was not able to go to the premiere in Atlanta and the way that she was not able to go to the Oscars uh, and sit with the other actors is deplorable. And that is something that should be discussed. But when this film is shown now on Turner Classic Movies, the fact that they bookend the movie now by having a discussion about it, I think is the way that this film should now always be presented. And I think it should be presented that way in movie theaters and moving forward. And it bothers me that Broadway has not caught up with that. And I think that there's no way, uh, you know, perhaps it's, uh, it's unions and it's everything that we start to have talkbacks in theaters where we present works of art as they were, because they are works of art, presenting them in the time frame in which they were written and talk about the time frame and the history in which these shows were created so that today's audiences can get a sense of what that period was like instead of negating it yeah. because it cannot be pushed under the rug. No, no. And, and, and it's so much, it's actually more interesting to have some of the backup information. Um, and and why not go out a little extra, spend an extra, you know, 10 minutes here and there to put it into context. Um, otherwise, you're going to erase it from history. No, you can't do that. That happened. You know, all this happened. And it happened in, in um, you know, phases and, and, and ways that a lot of people had no idea that they were acting racist. Mm -hmm. they, were, they were racist by default, not because they were racist. <laughs> they just were acting in a system. They were, they were, it, it's a very deep thing. And back to your original thing, that's why I'm still really engaged in what, what's mm -hmm. going on because it's, we got a lot of work to do. We still you know, a few years ago, the, you know, the, with the last revival of Annie on Broadway, um, and I remember the director of that production uh, saying, and I, and I think it led to the last movie version of Annie, uh, the Will Smith version, saying that he wanted to modernize it because he was at the theater and when the actors were singing, we'd like to thank you, Herbert Hoover, that the little girls behind him in the theater had no clue as to Herbert Hoover was. Right. And I said, this is a perfect example to teach them who Herbert Hoover was. 
instead of saying, you know, we're going to take it out the next time because nobody today knows who he is. Right. Um, we need to teach our kids our history instead of saying it never happened. Right. And, you know, and uh, so that was our history lesson for today, folks. <laughs> uh, we're going to run out of time, but before deep, we do. Deep stuff. Yes, deep stuff. Um, I, you know. This is my homage to James Lipton inside the actor's studio. I've got some questions I'd like to ask you, just some random stuff, just for the fun of it. So uh, I hope you have a little fun with this, okay? Uh -oh. So anything could come up. Uh, so uh, my first question to you, just to get a chance to know you a little bit better. Uh, do you do things now or later? In other words, are you a check them off kind of person i do them immediately yeah same so here. almost to a fault yeah i'm the same way then i end up having to do them more than once okay <laughs> um what is the best ritual of your daily daily life uh well i think that changes a little bit but lately through covid it was really about meals it, it mm -hmm. was about having sitting down across from my husband and having a meal Mm -hmm. and talking about what's going on and, and you know and 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 enjoying food as you can tell <laughs> but yeah i think i think the ritual of uh dinner that's and important. lunch and that's breakfast <laughs> yeah that's wonderful um, what is the worst thing that you ever said to your mother I said, shut up once. I said, shut up to my mother once. And she, the only time she's ever raised a, she slapped me. And I, and I, and I, I deserved it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Can you imagine a kid telling you to shut up? I beg your pardon. Wow. Oh. Wow. Wow. Uh, what is the biggest risk that you've ever taken? Um, well, there, uh, the, several come to mind. It usually, it usually it, for a while, it kind of revolved around the festival. It was like, okay, this festival is going to cost, you know, $150,000 mm -hmm. minimum. And, um, where is that money going to come from? And is it going to come in? So, uh, but like I said, I've, I've been very lucky with a lot of miracles, a lot of angels, anonymous angels even, which is a whole other thing, a whole other story, but. That's wonderful that they're there. That's yeah. great. Uh, what is the most rebellious thing that you've ever done? Oh, Lord, rebellious. You stumped me. <gasps> rebellious? Um, oh, God, I want to say I, I've kind of been a rebel to begin with. I mean, <laughs> I mean I love it. like quitting, you know, like not going to, to college for the right reason. You know, I, I guess I did go for the right reasons, but I, I just kind of knew that I didn't want to um, graduate. I wanted to get on with it. Um, so, you know, moving kind of, that's kind of rebellion, I guess. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, what is the most important action that you feel that you've ever taken in your career? Um, well, one of them, uh, is signing a ten-year lease on the space that that uh, oh, and we could say that that was a risk because um, we were about eighty thousand dollars in debt when I signed mm. the ten-year lease. Uh, <laughs> the space that's that a risk. Right that's a major risk. Um, now off the off the grid. Uh, what is your best vice? My best vice. Yes. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> do I dare say alcohol? No, I'm, I'm just kidding. No. 
Um, oh, oh, I got it. A nap. Oh. Okay. Oh, uh, I don't think that's advice. I think that's not advice. I think it's a necessity sometimes. <laughs> I don't take a nap, and I should. I need, I need it. Whenever I get a nap, I'm so excited and happy. Oh, that's it. good. That's great. <laughs> okay. Uh, what was your most embarrassing moment on stage? <laughs> well, okay. I was at City Hall, the City Hall here in New York, mm -hmm. and I... I ran out after making what I thought was a really quick uh, costume change and didn't realize that I had not even put on my tap shoes. And I counted off the band and I started tap dancing in socks. I mean, <laughs> on video, it's on video. Oh my God. Ridiculous, ridiculous. Oh my God, that's great. Yeah, that's and, pretty bad. That was and great. my last question to you is, who is the person who has helped you the most in your career? Um, I, I think it's probably Brenda. I think it's probably Brenda Buffalino. Wow. Um, because she had her own career. Uh, she was the dance partner of Charles Honey Coles, who was her mentor. So she was really the connection to the whole tap world, really. Mm -hmm. um, though, you know, I kind of uh, squinched my way in there on my own. I, I think that I have her to thank for introducing me to the tap world. Um, yeah, probably. That's great. Yeah. Well, don't go anywhere for a moment. I just want to thank everybody for tuning in today. Um, I'm sure I can speak for Tony when I say this. Uh, those of us in this business, we don't take it for granted when you spend time with us. So thank you for spending an hour with us this afternoon. Um, I hope if this is your first time here, that this will not be your last. Um, I have a little uh, tag on my uh, banner that says, join in the celebration. If you click on that little uh, button, uh, you will get a reminder uh, whenever I go live. Uh, and it will let you know about any upcoming shows. You can also check out the over 350 other artists that I have celebrated on this channel. My goal is to celebrate artists and their body of worth. And not only do I want you to check these artists out here, but if you read about them, go and see their live shows, check out what they're doing, read all of them and really tap in, tap into what they're doing and uh, keep up with their careers, uh, support them whenever you can, uh, because you know it's all about the interconnectedness. If you don't mind, please leave a comment here on YouTube about what you thought of today's show. Share this with your followers. Let other people know about this channel, and that will help us to grow. I also end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Go to your Facebook friends list. And I hope, Tony, that you will friend me on Facebook so that we can remain in touch there. Go to your Facebook friends list and the third name that pops up, reach out with a phone call. Not an email message, not a text message, not a private inbox message, a phone call. And let that person know what they mean in your life. As my dear friend, David Friedman, who, by the way, will be here on the show tomorrow. As he always says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. And I always say, if you're going to go out in a boat, make sure you bring a skipper along. Now, <laughs> I'm actually going to leave the screen, uh, Tony, and I'm going to give you the final word. Anything oh. you want to say about anything that we talked about today that you want to build upon, anything that we didn't talk about, that you wish that we had, or just any message that you want to put out to anyone who's watching right now. Uh, I thank you for the gifts that you've given to the world and that you're going to continue to give. I wish you and your husband the happiest of holidays and may 2022 uh, be even beyond your wildest dreams, the happiest, most profitable, successful year of your lives. 
Good luck with your new home in New Hope, Pennsylvania. And uh, don't worry about how to end the show because as soon as you say goodbye, I will take you off the screen. Thank you. And you're always welcome here. Thank you, Tony. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Well, thank you, Richard. It was such a pleasure to meet you and to do this, which is, you know, it, it's wonderful to talk and, 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 and clear your thoughts and bring new ones to the front. Um, I would just say happy new year to everybody. Um, uh, I know it's been a rough, uh, almost two years, but I think we're coming out of it now. I'm so proud of so many people for just hanging in there. Um, as my dad and my grandmother used to say, <laughs> oh, they always said, see you in the funny papers, which just makes me think, you know, they were really positive folks. So stay positive, everyone. Thank you and goodbye.